Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. We are in Galatians chapter 3. We're dealing with the foolish Galatians who have been bewitched. The last Bible study, in fact, the last two Bible studies we did, we were looking into how Jezebel, how the spirit of Jezebel, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mistress, the, the whore and the mistress of witchcrafts, how she bewitches the work that she does inside of a church or to a believer, to a denomination, to a ministry, how these, how these guys in these ministries are going astray. She bewitched them. How people <clears throat> can come to the Lord by grace through faith, just believing a few simple things out of the Bible, like you know John 3.16, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8, 1 John 1, 1.9. That's kind of the Romans road that we go on. How they can come to the Lord believing that and accepting it by faith, and then someone come to them with an agenda Oh, yeah, but you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to be Torah observant, or you have to speak in tongues and convulse, and you've got to be slain and all this stuff. Adding to the doctrine of grace through faith and adding some sort of performance or works or money or prayers that you must say or whatever. How these people get bewitched into this stuff. How Jezebel works. So we're going to move past that, and we're going to get into the core of what of what Paul is establishing in Galatians. He is he has dealt with his I mean he's angry in chapter one. Anybody that preaches any other gospel than what I preach, let him be a curse. He said it twice. And then in chapter two he's giving how he attained his doctrine. Chapter three, I'm going to lay it on you. Okay? And he's being serious about this. Oh foolish Galatians. I mean think about that. Here is a man <clears throat> that brought you into the church or brought you into church, um, got you involved in Christianity, and you receive a letter. He's moved on. Now you have a bishop over your church. You receive a letter from the Apostle Paul. Oh, goody, a letter from Apostle Paul. Uh, uh-oh, foolish Galatians. He's, he's angry. You can hear it in his tone, in his voice. He's very upset because he labored among them, and now he's had people come in behind him Grievous wolves, not sparing the flock. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth? How do you obey the truth? You ever thought about that? Let's see if I have that. Uh, why, yes, I believe I do. How you obey the truth. You believe it. You believe what you become submissive to what is being taught to you. That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. You know that Christ died. You know that he did what you cannot do. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now, to anybody out there who has encountered uh, someone saying, oh, you're saved? Well, that's great. Why don't you come to our church and have you, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they go after these young... Well, I, I don't know. I, I thought I did. Oh, no. You, did you speak in tongues? Did you have an experience? You, you weren't baptized in... The, and so the, what they're going to do is they're going to bring them to a church where they're going to get, get them hopped up or hyped up in an emotional state, lay hands on them, hit them on the forehead, make them feel like they're slain in the Spirit. They pass out, fall backwards... Everybody jumps up and dances. Oh, they got it now. Oh, Shonda Labatoya. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? By some guy hitting you on the head? How do you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? By, by going to a church and getting hyped up with the music and an emotional uh, release? How is, how is it you get or receive the Holy Ghost? By the hearing of faith. It comes by the Word of God. I have this... This is something that God has ingrained in me, and it's in there, and, and nobody's taken it away. This Bible is as much a part of the Holy Spirit as any kind of joy that you felt by the presence of God or doodads going up and down your neck when, you, when God was leading you through thoughts and you realized some, some great thing 
or you're reading the scriptures, and I mean you just, the emotions come out of you over the word of God. People, <clears throat> somebody sent me a message yesterday. They said, Pastor, we're just studying some words out of the Bible, and we're just, our eyes are just full of tears. We're just reading, and I'm just seeing things I never saw in the Bible before. That's the Holy Ghost working through the pages of the Word of God. Think about your words. How are they produced? Air, spirit. Air comes out of our lungs. It comes out of us. Air comes out of our lungs in the form of our vocal cords shape the air with the vibrations, which is our voice, and then we further shape that air with our tongue, our teeth, our lips, the the movement of our jaw and our and our and our mouth and our tongue in there. We either stop the air like when we say the letter T or the letter P, or we shape the air by the way we move our mouth, right? And everybody has a different accent. It's because they're they're trained, their tongue automatically forms syllables and consonants a certain way. But it all has to do with our spirit, the breath that comes out of us. These are the, and those form the words. The spirit is not just some feeling that you get. Ooh, 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 I get, ooh, I'm getting, oh, ooh, man, this is glory coming into me. What is that? That's an emotional ecstasy. This is what church services are doing. They're giving out ecstasy. They're giving out heroin in the form of the praise and worship, in the form of these emotional roller coasters that these people go on. Because as soon as they leave the high of the church, they go right back down and their problems are still there. So they got to get higher the next time, right? You know how it works. When you've settled in your mind that what Jesus said in John chapter 6, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And what happened when he said that, many of his disciples walked away from him, went backward, walked with him no more. That's John 6. 66. You go figure that out. Okay? It's the, it's the Word of God is the Spirit of God. Jesus and the Holy Ghost, they do not part. They're not separate. They don't disagree with, one, well, Jesus came to save us. But the Holy Spirit does all this stuff. Don't believe that. Paul said that you don't receive the Spirit by the works of the law. Now, let me, I have so many different issues to deal with, whether it's a Roman Catholic background or a or a charismatic background, or a Hebrew roots, Torah observant background. There's so many ways of, of cutting this and applying this. Let's deal with the Sabbath keepers and the Torah keepers. Do they, do they receive more Holy Spirit than you because they go to church on Saturday? Do they get more of the Holy Spirit because they went to a, a Passover feast that bears little to no resemblance to what's in the Scripture? Because that's their claim. Their claim is that they please God more because they do more of the law. But the problem is, if you don't perform 100% of the law, you don't please God. Whenever you leave something out, God's requirement was 100% perfection and performance. And these people, and it's not just in the Hebrew roots, it's in fundamentalism as well. These people will tell you, well... If you, uh, if you observe most of the Torah that you can, then God will bless you more or you're closer to God or you're going to hear from God more. Then one group will tell you, no, if you speak in tongues more or you do this more or you do that more, then God will be closer to you or you will get more from God. Then there's this, the, the fundamentalist group over here. It says, if you cut your hair short, guys, ladies, if you grow your hair out long, ladies, if you wear a dress down to your ankles, if you quit watching... Uh, uh, CNN and uh, quit watching, uh, uh, I don't know, just TV shows, quit watching these things, quit listening to that kind of music, then you're going to be closer to God than other people are. And you're pleasing God because you don't have the things in your life that other uh, liberal or worldly Christians have. I'm all about God cleaning up our lifestyles. Don't get me wrong. But that doesn't make us closer to God or means that we're going to get more from God. Or it means that we have more of the Holy Spirit. from God. You, you want more of the Holy Spirit? You open this book and start reading. Let God soothe you with his balm of Gilead. Let God chasten you with the rod of the Bible. Use the sword of the word of God to fend off your enemies. 
Use the plow, beat the sword into a plowshare and plow up stony ground areas of your life. That's the Holy Spirit. That's how you get it. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. You heard the Word of God preached. The conviction of the Holy Ghost poured down on your life. Tears ran out of your eyes. You, you prayed, God, deal with me. God, help me. God, I'm, I'm filthy. I'm vile and disgusting. God, I, I, I have ways that are not right. God, clean me up. That's the Holy Spirit right there. Anyway, this is only what I learned of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Think about it. I mean, look, look at my short hair. Look at that. Okay? Boy, God says it's shame for a man to have long hair. Bless God, I ain't like one of them hippies. I got me short hair. God, that pleases God right there. See that? I'm closer to God because I got short hair. Let me tell you why I like short hair. Don't have to fool with it. It's in my nature to like short hair. I don't like it when my hair gets any length at all. Now, I have been. My wife has been helping me. She cuts my hair, leaving more of it on the top here to kind of cover up what's What's what the, some of these hairs that's been jumping ship going? Hey, this guy's this guy's going down. We're leaving. Okay. Other than that, I just it's in my nature to like short hair. It's in my nature to not dress a certain way, to not want to be a certain, or sit and watch television for hours on end, watching sitcoms and dramas and this and that and the other. I mean, I'm not bragging. Not in any way. I can't. Because in my life, what God has cleaned up in my life, I can tell you he still has things to work on. And I can tell that he's working on them. And I love that. But I'm not now closer to God because I have done these things. I'm closer to God because... God drew me close to him. And every time I open this book, I'm here with him. The hearing of faith is how you receive the grace and the blessings of God. Not by having begun in the Spirit. Because when you got saved, you may have, you may, some of you guys may have had long hair. May have had a Budweiser t-shirt. When you got saved, God didn't say, well, I'll save you if you cut your hair, get rid of that t-shirt. That's not what God said. God said, I'll save you. Having begun in the spirit, we are not made perfect by the works of the flesh or by the performance of the flesh. Anybody, and I keep saying this, but you just, you, you start listening and watching people's lives. Anybody that has some sort of external idea that what I do on the outside benefits God and God is going to be closer to me because I have high standards or I live a certain way or I'm Torah observant or I do this or I do that. Anybody like that, they will not stop boasting about it. They will always boast themselves over you. Always. They do it to me. There are people who have made videos on me, made comments on me, that they are far better and they, they live a better life and they do this and they do that and they saw my post one time that I did this or I said this or I was a part of this and they went after me on that and they said, we just, we don't, we want to please God. We don't want to have these things in our life. Then don't have them. But don't tell me how good you are and how close to God you are because you do these things. Why don't you, instead of going against me or somebody else, why don't you write down on Facebook or Twitter or on your blog or make a YouTube video, you look into a camera and say, let me tell you all my dirty little secrets. Let me tell you about all the women that I've lusted after. Let me tell you about all the things I've done, the things I've looked on, the things I've listened to. Let me tell you about the thoughts that's run through my mind. Let them make a video on themselves. I do. I'll tell you right now that I can't, I'm not perfect won't be perfect in this life. But I can see God working in my life. And that's by God's grace because I trust Him. 
I never trust me. And you shouldn't either. You should trust this and only this. And how God leads you, that's how God leads you. But it's having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? The answer is no. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you by the, the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Twice now, twice, Paul has established the idea that you are connected to the Spirit and you are full of the Spirit when you are hearing either by listening to the preaching or by reading yourself and hearing it in your mind when you hear the words of the Holy Ghost in your Bible. So which is it? You went and had a ritual done on you and they said you spoke in tongues? Is that how it works? Or you just believe the Bible and believe what it says and let God do in you what God does in you? It's your choice. Now, this is what was interesting. I don't know why I did this, but he mentions the hearing of faith, the hearing of faith. He mentions faith twice. Faith is the foundational part of what our response to what God does. God provided Christ. He provided the means whereby we can be justified, where we can have be robed in righteousness, uh, cloaked in the righteousness of Christ, where we can have eternal life and these um, great and precious promises given to us. He calls us sons of God. God provides all of these things. But you have a responsibility, and your responsibility is faith. Do you believe what God said? So I, I went to the um, Pure Bible Search software. Go to uh, purebiblesearch.com, download a free copy, Linux, Windows, Mac, work on any of them, and type in the word faith. And I was surprised. I really was surprised that just the word faith, is only found twice in the whole Old Testament. 39 books of the Old Testament. The word faith only twice in there. Now, faithful and faithfulness and things like that, that's in the Old Testament several times. A lot of it's ascribed to God, God being faithful and so on. But let me give you the two verses where the word faith is used in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32. I'll pick it up in verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation. Children in whom is no faith. Boy, I thought, boy, how true that is. Even the Jews, this was, Deuteron Deuteronomy 32 was Moses' last words. A lot of, they came from God, Moses giving them to the people. And one of the last things that Moses said to the Jews was, God's going to hide his face from you because you have no faith. They wandered in 40 years. Why? Because they didn't believe Joshua and Caleb who came back and said, Guys, God said that he was going to put down our enemies before we even got there. Why don't we just march in there and watch all these people fall? But the ten, you know the ten, ten commandments, ten spies said, we can't go in there. They're, they're so big, we can't do that. The law will never tell you you can go to heaven. Now, you might be telling yourself that because you keep some of the laws that you are, you're going to get some big thing from God. But the law never tells you. In fact, show me in the covenant that God made with Israel, show me where God promised them eternal life in heaven. No. To my knowledge, I may be wrong on this, but to my knowledge, in the law, the covenant that God made with them at Mount Sinai, it was only about getting that land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Tigris River, Euphrates River. It had nothing to do with heaven. It's a type and a shadow, but it had... He didn't say heaven, didn't say eternal life. I'll let you live. And God had to say to them finally in Deuteronomy 32, I'm going to turn my face from you. You're not going to see me. You're going to wander off and get into your own little religious ideologies, and they are right now. Judaism is full of Sumerian, Babylonian, Canaanite mysticism, Kabbalah. That's where they, they got it from Egypt, they got it from Canaan. They got it from the Assyrians. They got it from the Babylonians. They, I mean, they pulled it in from everywhere. These Jewish sages and rabbis that these Hebrew roots people follow, they're leading them right into the practice of Kabbalah. They don't realize it, but that's where they're going. And so God said, children in, in whom is no faith. And to this day, the Jew 
has faith in himself and Moses, but not in God. He thinks that he can please God or achieve oneness with the, with the unknowing or the unknowable, unnameable God, the silent God who is in darkness. They believe they can make a connection with him through observance of the Torah because that's the ten sephiroth. That's, I won't get into all that. But they practice Kabbalah and they believe that they can achieve oneness with God by performance of the law. They don't believe. They don't trust. They practice. They do. And so he said, um, children in whom is no faith, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. Now watch this. God said, you set up another God. You call him, you call him Jehovah or Yahweh, but he's really Baal. Because his counterpart, Shekinah, is really Ashtaroth. And God said, you've provoked me to jealousy with something that's not God. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to provoke you to jealousy. Look what he says. Um, he said, I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. That's, that's me. That's us. And how's he going to provoke them to anger? By us becoming Torah observant, trying to be like the Jews? No. By us being Gentiles who did not receive the oracles of God in the Old Testament at Mount Sinai, who are not of the seed of Abraham, whom God did not choose and call, he's going to provoke Israel to jealousy because he's going to give people and put his glory on Gentiles that are not Jews who do not observe the law. And the Jew's going to go, well, that ain't fair. We observe the law and we don't get that. How come they get that? God said, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. With dirty, nasty, rotten people that you hate, dog Gentiles. They're filthy. They're vile. They're disgusting. They're crude. And I'm going to lead them into glory and put my spirit in them. And I'm not going to give you anything. You think about that. Boy, you think about that. That's Israel. And then the second place, Habakkuk 2, verse 1. He said, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Make it plain upon tables. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 10, I believe, We use plainness of speech and not as Moses. Not as Moses. Moses had a, had hardness of speech, a stutterer. Paul said, "We use make it. We we're going to make it plain for you to read." So he said, "For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith." And Paul quoted that part of that verse several times: "The just shall live by faith." those that are justified by God in his righteousness. We don't live by works. We live by faith. We live every day saying, God, I have failed you yet again. I dishonored you. I've broken your commandments. I broke the law yet again. God, I wanted today to be perfect. And yet when I look back, I realize that I've been in sin Never even thought anything about it. Oh, wretched man that I am. So God, I cannot trust what I do to perform your righteousness. I can only trust Jesus and what he said and the promises you gave me in your word. I can only trust that. God will bless that. God will honor that. God will say, God will say you're justified because the just shall live by his faith. Okay? And as for now, there is a justification coming to Israel. He said that the vision is yet for an appointed time. And, and I'm going to make this analogy with, like with DNA. Um, your DNA, 46 chromosomes worth. And in other words, there are 46 bundles of DNA coiled up in there. Three billion connections of the four base pairs. There is a machine called RNA polymerase that scans your DNA and it's looking for a certain code because the body is telling it, hey, we need some more of these proteins. 
So it'll scan your DNA and make, and when it finds that protein, it'll start copying it, and then it'll send it to a machine that'll start building the proteins and folding it and do, doing what the DNA says, and then it'll make that protein. There are things in your DNA that uh, well, just think about it. A, a child is born, and that child is, has the potential to create babies or birth babies, whether it's male or female. But, and that's all coded in the DNA, but the DNA doesn't produce that ability until we say they get into puberty, uh, adolescence into puberty, and then they get to that age in their teens where we know that they can make babies, but they couldn't make them when they were five or six years old. The DNA didn't code, it wasn't, it wasn't time yet. And there are promises in this book that God says are latent. They're not for this time, but they are for an appointed time. And one of these days, Jesus is going to open the book and he, all the things then that, are, that should be done and need to be done will be done including this right here. Boy, I le when you learn about DNA, doctrine just makes sense now. Bible doctrine, Bible prophecy makes sense. You're just going, okay? It, think it, I'll give you an illustration. Here's Jesus, and he goes to the synagogue. This is Luke chapter 4. He's done his 40 days of fasting. He's run the devil off. He goes to the synagogue, and they give him the book. It's, it's Isaiah, 66 books, 66 chapters, right? Or 66 books in your Bible. So it's a prototype of the whole Bible. Jesus opens up. He doesn't read the entire book of Isaiah, start to finish. He only goes to a certain place. Isaiah 60, I think it's 63. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and you know, he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor and you know, set it at liberty, those that have been captive. And he reads all that stuff, and halfway through the sentence, he closes the book, and he sits down, and he says, this day is this prophecy fulfilled in your ears. And it's just like, the RNA polymerase, re, re, only reading a certain part of your overall DNA, making that protein, and then it's done. Okay? Jesus came to fulfill that part at that time. He then moved on and later fulfilled that part at that time. When he's on the cross, when he's on the cross, he's got two thieves next to him. There's three crosses there. Why? He's numbered with the transgressors. And that was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It was in the DNA of the Old Testament, and Jesus came to fulfill it at that time. He doesn't fulfill it every single day. Jesus is not dying over again like the Roman Catholic Mass. Okay? And it's just that when you understand that DNA, how DNA works, and I still have much to learn. I'm trying to teach myself. And everything I learn, I'm just going, oh, that's, that's in the Bible. I know what that is in the Bible. And I love it. I love passing it on. But anyway, um, the two places in the Old Testament where the word faith is used, God says to Israel, they're people of no faith, and then he says there's going to be a people that's going to figure out that the just shall live by his faith. So even in the Old Testament, God had established and prophesied of the doctrine of the justification by faith. Now I'm going to read uh, just one part out of Romans. It's going to be Romans 10. Uh, on this part of this, and I've got many, many, many more verses to go. But turn to Romans 10. Let's start reading in verse 8 because Paul mentions that you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith. That those who do miracles do it by the hearing of faith, not the works of the law, not a ritual that they perform. So they hear the Word of God. They have faith that God can do these things, and then God does them. So where does that come from? Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. The word is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith. This Bible means to go out into your heart to give you faith and confidence. God will, God will show you things from time to time. And you'll see that your life and how God is moving in your life is in your Bible. Maybe there's a doctrine you read and, you're, and God's been dealing with you about that. Or maybe there's a story that you read and you're going, man, that's me right there. And the Holy Ghost is showing you those things. He is building your faith by giving you more of the Word and giving you a better understanding of the Word. The more I understand about the Bible, the more I believe it. And I believe every word of it. But it's just, it's that joy of reading something in the Bible. Maybe you read it a hundred times and the hundred and first time you're going, I never saw that. Look at there. 
wow, that's God doing that. And you're going, man, this Bible, you'll hear me preach. This Bible is right. And when I say that, it's because once again, God has convinced me that my Bible is never wrong. And I'm human. I guess I need convinced over and over every now and then. It's like, why do I tell my, li my wife I love her just about every day? I don't miss a day. If I do, it's unusual. Why do I tell her that? I don't want to forget it. I don't want to forget it. And I want her to feel confident that my heart is still directed toward her. And I do it every day. Okay? God will increase our faith every day. He'll remind us every day this Bible's right. That's the word of faith. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. See, you've got to believe it here in your soul. Your soul is your heart. You've got to believe it down in your heart. Down here in the four chambers where God wants to sit on the throne. All right? You've got to believe it there. Once you believe it there, it will come out. I'm telling you what I believe. I don't have a problem with what I believe and stand for coming out of my mouth. Okay? I can't tell you 100% that I think Barack... People say, Barack Obama's the Antichrist. I can't preach that. I can't say that because I don't believe it. So I'm not going to pass it around. Hey, this guy said Barack Obama may be the Antichrist. We'll forget about him in about a year. All right? Anyway, for with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. See? Your belief brings your righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. When you believe, you will confess. You won't have a problem with it. You will not have a problem with it. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That means if you believe, it'll come out of your... Are you a Christian? You know what? Yes, I am. I was talking to a guy standing in line at the pharmacy. And I don't know what prompted me. We just kind of talked, chick chat a little bit. And I, and I asked him, I said, how did the election turn out, you think? He went, eh. And you know what he did? He looked at me right in the eye and he said, I'll, I'm going to be honest with you. And he said... I don't believe in abortion. I don't vote for people that are for abortion. I think that's murder. And I'm just going, dude. And, he, you know, he had one of those military caps on, so I was going to talk to him anyway and tell him thank you for serving his country. And, I mean, we just had a ball sitting there, and he started quoting Scripture, and I did too. And I said, in case you didn't know, I'm a preacher. He said, I had that figured about you. And when we parted, I, the last word I said to him was, I'll see you in New Jerusalem. Because I'm pretty sure the guy's going to be there. Okay. And uh, what was that? But, but anyway, he didn't have a problem opening his mouth and confessing to me that that's what he believed in. And he was just old enough to where if I didn't agree with it, he didn't care. Didn't, didn't face him one bit. His life was already set. He didn't have to worry about pleasing me. And it just came out of his mouth. And I'm going, see, you, you say what you believe in. Okay? You say, and I guarantee you, even the quiet people, when someone provokes you enough and they start talking about how church is bad and Bible's stupid and anybody that, you'll get mad and you'll just say, you know what, I believe that Bible. I'm a born-again Christian. I'm not the perfect person in the world, and y'all know that, but I believe what God said. Whoo, they'll, they'll go, whoa. You'll get your dander up and you will confess what you believe in. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Did you hear that? Some of you people. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the book of Joel, chapter 2, isn't it? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Your feet. There's 26 bones in one foot, but there's 33 bone joints. That means between your two feet, you've got 66 connections of bones. That's why the feet are beautiful. The feet of, are beautiful of them who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Here we go. Here is how you obey the gospel. Here's how you do it. Look in your Bible. Verse 16, Romans 10, But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, 
who hath believed our report? That's Isaiah 53. If you don't believe the report of the gospel, the report of the Bible, you're not saved. If you don't believe it, that's being obedient to the truth. Not performing some work, but believing. And the gospel is not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's Isaiah 53. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's Exodus. Uh, I'm trying to think of where the Passover was. Whatever that chapter, that's the gospel. Okay, It's the gospel in a shadow and a type, but it's the gospel. And Moses believed what God said. And when you believe it, you won't have a problem doing it. Noah believed what God said about the flood. And Noah believed what God said about building that ark. And when you believe it, you don't have a problem doing it. It's not their works. It's their faith. But the faith will always produce the works. That's the book of James. That's what it's about. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And without the Bible, there is no salvation by faith by grace, or through faith by grace. There is no salvation. And people think, preachers think, that they can preach for 30, 45 minutes, get people hyped up in a, an emotional state, and get them to the altar by their words, but not the word of God. That's a disservice to people's souls. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. That's Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day utter a speech. Night unto night showeth language. There is no voice or language where their voice is not heard. That's what he's quoting here. Verse 19, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. That was Habakkuk where the word faith was used. The second time the word faith was in the Old, Old Testament was Habakkuk chapter 2. And he's quoting that here. Uh, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by the foolish nation. I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. God said, I've reached out to you, the Jews, for thousands of years now. And you've never reached back. And yet here these filthy, nasty, heathen, pagan Gentiles are. And I'm going to save me a bunch of them. Whether they decide to keep the laws or not, I'm going to save them because they live by faith. And that's how I'm going to bring them and give them eternal life. See, God's right. Paul's right. And all these people that will approach you or have approached you about, oh, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you need to speak in tongues, oh, you need to be slain in the Spirit, you need to be Torah observant, you need to quit watching television, or you cannot listen to this, or you cannot go to this place, and you must wear this clothes, and you must do this, and you must go out with us in our bus ministry, and you must perform this and perform that. <laughs> Pastors that are constantly chiding their church, I mean browbeating them, because they're not going out knocking every door in town and bringing people into the church. It's not my place to tell everybody what they ought to be doing. That's God's place. And if I don't think God is big enough to make them do it, who am I? And I know that preachers can make church people do, in some cases, anything they ask them to. We hear of preachers all the time going to some of their women saying, uh, you know, God wants me to minister to you this way. You know what I'm talking about, right? Preachers can manipulate people and make them do all kinds of stuff and then make them think that because they're doing that, that they're closer to God and the people who don't do that stuff, well, they're just kind of out on the outskirts and God's not going to bless them. I've actually had, had people notify me that their pastor preached a message about his inner circle, all the people that sucked up to the pastor and did everything he said and then there was the Sunday morning crowd who only came Sunday morning like they were lesser Christians than everybody else was. If I'd have heard that sermon, I, I would have never darkened the doors of that church again until that pastor repented. Guys, it is not our place to dictate to everybody in our church what we think they ought to be doing. You pray and you preach that book, God will do things. 
God has shown me that very, very clearly. The number of people who sit under my ministry, I have no idea how they got here. Not a clue. I just know that our people didn't go out and promote this and do this, and I didn't make them do this and do that. I just let God do it. God did it way better than any way that I've ever tried in my life. Pastors, let God do it. He'll do it better than you. Okay? And if you don't trust him to make your people do what God wants them to do, you don't trust God very much. It's really not in our hands. We're to feed the sheep and lead them. Let the great shepherd show them what to do in life. Okay? Man, I love you. I love this book, too, and I love what it says. It wants to make men free, and I want you to be free. Okay? Be free in this book. Be free in the gospel. Be free in the truth. All right? Love you. We'll uh, pick back up. The whole purpose of us, and let me just say this going into next week. The whole purpose of me getting into Galatians was because it was an answer to the Hebrew roots and the sacred name people and the, Jeho and the maybe Jehovah's Witness, but the Seventh-day Adventists telling everybody you've got to keep the law and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And it basically is a response because all of these other clowns have some, some way of twisting the book of Galatians. And I'm just going to deliver it to you for what it says. Here's what it says. I think you should believe what the book says. All right? That way you are armed. The best way I can arm you is to say, read this book and believe it. And then, you're, then you're armed. And somebody says, well, you know, uh, what Paul was really doing was he was telling them they had to keep the law. That's not what he said here. You can just pull out King, King James, open that up and say, See what's in there? Paul never said that. Okay? Anyway, I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.